Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know me yet, um, I've been a qualitative researcher for a very, very long time. Uh, nowadays, I'm pretty much a full-time trainer. I've written a book on interviewing, I'm a fellow of the Market Research Society, and I have a website called qualitativemind.com. So that's just to kind of establish my credentials in, in terms of talking about this stuff. Um, and what I'm going to do is just set the scene in terms of computers and analysis uh, and how people might approach uh, this whole idea of computer-aided software uh, analysis. So the first point is really that software and computers don't seem to be a natural fit with qualitative data which is really based on subtleties of language, metaphors, imagery, layers of meaning. And analysis needs immersion, interpretation, insight, and it takes time. And most researchers I know feel they don't have enough time to analyze. So when you see something that says, great research made easy, and a software package, I think the wish fulfillment kicks in. After all, computers are so clever these days. Maybe you could just feed in the transcripts and press a button. You could save days of time. Perhaps what it's all about is some form of artificial intelligence that's trained to recognize certain features and make predictions. After all, Google Glass for market research is going to have an AI that will be able to analyze what it sees. And it's just basically pattern matching. If you're remotely familiar with the concept of social media listening, you'll know that text analytics has become quite sophisticated. So on this chart, you need to look from the bottom up to the top uh, to see uh, how much more understanding there is in text analytics nowadays. But actually, while there might be some elements of automatic coding in some of the packages that are available for us to use, to be honest, it really does rely on brain power as much as computer power. Now, in this chart, I'd like to start by looking up at the top. Um, the acronym that's often used for this is CACDAS which stands for Computer Assisted Qualitative Data Analysis. Um, but I think some people nowadays prefer to simply call it QDA. So the first thing to note is that it's actually been around for quite a long time. Uh, but it is keeping up with the times now. Uh, you can input all sorts of data now, um, not just transcripts of interviews, but all sorts of texts open ends from surveys, audio, YouTube, social media, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and underneath you can see the logos of some of the packages um, that you can buy and use to do this. But going back to um, the text bit, um, you would probably notice that this CACDAS networking project here is run by Surrey University Sociology Department. And this brings me to a very important point uh, about what's been going on with this software. Um, and that is that it's much more widely used in academia and in social research. Now, I have a slightly outdated um, report from 2007 that says only 9% of UK market researchers use CACDAS. And actually, I don't have much reason to believe um, that that percentage has changed dramatically um, since that time. It would be great to know if it has. Uh, but first of all, let's just have a look at why it is um, so much more widely used in academia and social research. Now, there are a number of reasons which I'll come to, but I think one of the sort of fundamental ones is that what this software does is to provide an audit trail, a record of how the analysis was done. Um, now, we often talk about you know, the black box of analysis. That is not good enough 
if you are doing research for the government or if you're doing it for your PhD and you have to be able to explain to people how you came to those recommendations, you have to be able to trace back that thinking um, from your data to the, the categories and the concepts, the themes, the core story and the recommendations that you're actually making and I think this is a really important part of the value of it all. But let's say you are a market researcher um, and you probably want to know what tips the balance because in the end the type of research and the processes you're doing may not be that hugely different. So looking at the left hand side of the slide, let's assume uh, market research, you're using mainly your brain maybe a, a bit of a spreadsheet or a mind map or um, you know something else to to help you with that but you're quite likely to be working with you know somewhere between four and eight groups um, and a relatively limited number of, of depth interviews and to be honest at that sort of scale if that's what a lot of your projects are like it's probably faster to do the analysis um, you know pinning up everything on the wall, doing your, your big sheet of paper, um, going through the transcripts, uh, however, um, because you know your brain can take it all in, you can work with it all and the chances are, I have to say, that your clients are not going to challenge it, in fact your clients are probably going to want less detail rather than more detail. But then if we move over onto the right hand side where if you're doing very, very much larger projects um, and I think, uh, well uh, my impression is certainly that uh, for social research, uh, for you know reasons, for political reasons very often, one needs to have a larger samples, there'll be larger volumes of data, probably multiple researchers and multiple phases and it's all um, you know, requires much more detailed analysis and is subject to scrutiny. So if you're working with this, and this could still be market research, it doesn't have to be social research, but it's generally about the size and complexity of the project. At this point, this is what tips the balance to using your brain and this fully fledged kind of software. Because you will have to buy or license uh, the software and there is a, uh, a learning curve but actually the money and the time that you invest in that is going to create a return in terms of the flexibility and accuracy and actually I do know some researchers who once they've got used to using this software on bigger projects um, are quite happy to use it on smaller projects because you don't always need to start with you know full transcripts or anything like that. Um, so uh, just to very quickly, uh, this goes back to that paper from Ruth Retty that I mentioned earlier. Uh, she did a little experiment where she had a market researcher do four groups and online food shopping and then compared the kind of analysis the market researcher did um, with some computer analysis using a package called Qualrus. Now both types actually agreed on the main findings, so there was no uh, dispute at all in terms of what those were, but what the Qualrus analysis did was to pick up on things that were much more detailed, much more granular and often minority findings um, that weren't mentioned for whatever reason by the market researcher. Um, but did add richness and potential implications and Ruth actually felt at this point that it was really about using CACDAS as a supplementary tool for qualitative market research, it's not either or, it's actually doing both um, and of course it is possible to go back over your data and do a, a, a much more detailed analysis later on. So at this point you might be thinking, oh God, um, do you have to be Einstein to use it? Uh, to which the answer is actually no, but what I want to do is to, before I hand over to people who talk much more specifically about the software, is to give you a little reminder of what it is that we actually do when we're doing qualitative analysis. 
and hopefully this will make it much clearer as to how you can use the software. So to use a qualitative metaphor, um, when we do qualitative, it's a bit like watching a play uh, in order to make sense of it. And all the quantitative has given us all the data about, you know, where, where the play is set, more or less what happens, who's in it, the general trajectory. What we're trying to do as qualitative researchers is to understand the concepts and the emotions that drive the actions that we see in that play. And if you've ever done any kind of um, literature analysis, uh, you'll know that once you come to understand you know, a play, for example, like Hamlet, everything you know about the motivations, the emotions, the dynamics, and all of that will transfer from the stage play to the film, even though in the film it's the CEO of Denmark Corporation that's killed, but the essence of the story is exactly the same. Um, and the way in which we come to this understanding is this kind of hierarchical thing where we go beyond the words to the wider significance and meaning. So if we take this example of these words here, um, what these are examples of are references to, in Hamlet, uh, a lot of talk about ears and also about poison, and at one point actually po pouring poison into an ear. So it's a recurring and significant theme. So we need something that's going to help us notice when these sorts of things happen. Um, and then once we do that, we have to use our brains to understand what the symbolic meaning is of these themes which in this case is about manipulation and corruption. And what we end up with is an insightful truth about how the dishonesty of leaders can destroy their organizations. So actually, it's a kind of hierarchical thing. Um, and I'm just going to refer briefly back to that slide that I showed you earlier, which has just simply got the hierarchy on its side about moving from basic data to higher level concepts. So that's what the thinking is about. And that is where the software helps us do this thinking. Um, and actually, there are two parts to the thinking. We, we, we talk about analysis and interpretation, and they are actually two distinct processes, even though they probably happen more or less at the same time. So analysis is about analyzing and organizing the stuff you've got to work with. So let's see, say that pile of Lego bricks um, is actually our data, because sometimes it feels like that. Um, and what we do in analysis is to sort it all um, and try and see what we can build with it. The idea being that we try and use as many of those Lego bricks as we can to build that story. Um, and this is really where um, it's certainly an analysis that the software facilitates hugely because it will help us um, just access things. It will code, search, retrieve. It will help us make comparisons, visualize things. It really just automates all of these processes. So you have more time to be asking those important interpretive questions. So it helps you to sort the data into categories, to capture those thoughts that come out of that, to make searches and queries and go to those higher levels. You know, it's that going up the hierarchy all of the time, but actually making sure nothing is left out. That's why it's so much more accurate um, than just using brain alone. Um, and it does many other things, but it also um, helps you with displays, so you can see what the building blocks of your story are. You can get that kind of helicopter view, so that ultimately, with any luck, what you can do is to build that complete story um, and know what it is that's been going on in your play and have a really rich um, and detailed explanation for it. Um, so that's me done now. Um, I just really want to say that uh, in fact, you know, what it is about is working with the brain and amplifying the ability to, to handle that. 
Um, and although it's come on a massive amount, it's really still a long way away from understanding human needs and motivations um, in the way that some of us um, might quite like it to. So thank you very much.